Hello all, uh, welcome to the webinar series of IEEE Joint MTT APMC CAS uh, Chapter Islamabad. I'm Dr. Noshir Vanshweb, the chair of the chapter, also working as uh, associate professor at Research Institute for Microwave and Millimeter Wave Studies at National University of Science and Technology, Islamabad, Pakistan. So we are located in Islamabad. Uh, Islamabad is the capital of Pakistan and also uh, one of the beautiful city that has both natural beauty and also a business hub. And this is a place where we will conduct uh, first interna IEEE International Conference on Microwave Antennas and Circuits, also known as ICMAC 2021. That will be the first dedicated RF and microwave conference for Pakistan. And I, ho I hope you will visit Pakistan. You will visit, you will visit Islamabad to present your research. As far as our university is concerned, National Institute of Science and Technology, Islamabad, uh, also known as NAST, has several campuses in the, in, the, in the country. And this is a bird's eye view of, of Islamabad campus. And the RIMS is located here. This RIMS, also known as Research Institute for Microwave and Millimeter Wave Studies, is a specialized um, uh, institute which offer MS and PhD degrees in RF and microwave with specialization in um, RF and microwave. Apart from theoretical concept, we also have state of the art research facilities, including an anechoic chamber that works up to 40 gigahertz. This chamber is used for antenna characterization. We have both near field and far field setup. We also have the electromagnetic compatibility interference lab. This lab is basically used for peer compliant testing as well, also to use in the course. We also have a microwave research and antenna lab and PCB fabrication lab. So, idea is to uh, built all these labs under one roof so that students, apart from their design, they can also develop the system and also test the system. So in this way, the student will get an hand-on experience and this will also help them in their future career. So um, as uh, we have started in, in pandemic, we started the webinar series back in March 2020 and we have conducted a number of webinars. This is webinar number 18 and we are very pleased to uh, have Professor Marcos Robinstein from University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Western Switzerland with us. The title of his talk is The Lightning Phenomena. A few words about Professor Marcus. So Professor Marcus Robinstein received the master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from University of Florida, Gainesville. In the decade of in the 1990s, he worked as a research engineer at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne and as a program manager at Swisscom in the area of electromagnetic compatibility and lightning. Since 20, 2001, he is a professor at University of Applied Science and Arts of Western Switzerland, uh, Vendon uh, Les Mines, where he is currently responsible for Advanced Communication Technologies Group. He is an author and co-author of 300 scientific publications in reviewed journals and international conferences. He's also co-author of nine book chapters and co-editor of a book on time reversal. He served as a editor in chief of Open Atmospheric Science Journal and currently serves as associate editor of IEEE Transaction of on EMC. <laughs> Professor Bustein received the best master's thesis award from University of Florida, the IEEE Achievement Award, and he's a co-recipient of NASA's recognition for innovative technological work award. He also received the ICIP CARB uh, Worker Award. He is a fellow of IEEE and an EMP fellow, a member of the Swiss Academy of Sciences and the International Union of Radio Science. So we are very pleased to have him on board. Now we request Professor Marcus to please start his webinar. Over to you, Professor Marcus. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, for the, the uh, kind introduction. And thank you very much for the for the invitation. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, uh, if I do, I have to share maybe my screen again. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Um, the desktop. And just one second. Okay. Can you see my the presentation now? Yes, I can see your presentation and your video. You may proceed ahead. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the. And I'm very pleased to be uh, given this talk. This talk. So uh, let me go right to the uh, outline of the presentation. Uh, the, I will be touching upon three main topics. One of them is what lightning is and the main lightning processes. 
then how lightning parameters are measured and how lightning is detected and how lightning is located. So what is actually lightning? So lightning was defined, uh, this is a definition I, think, I believe uh, that was given by Professor Martin Newman, who is one of the main uh, lightning researchers uh, in the past century and this century. Uh, he defined it as a, a transient high current electric discharge whose path length is measured in kilometers. And this makes it actually not uh, so easy to reproduce in the lab because some of the processes require actually that you have a long discharges and they're, they're actually too long for, for a lab in, in, in general. So many things have been still done in the lab. Many things as you will see in this talk are done actually with actual lightning. So let me give you some information about the effects of lightning. Uh, first of all, just how much money this costs and you know about 30 to 60 percent of all power outages every year in the United States are really, uh, I mean, it's similar to Europe also in other places that I mean, the, the, the amount, uh, they're, they're related to lightning. And so they cost about a billion dollars. Uh, lightning strikes can cost in addition also about a billion dollars in uninsured losses. You know, this is a 2012 statistic, but it's similar right now. And it's even expected to be worse because of the use of more sensitive electronics and because uh, climate change may be uh, responsible for increasing the number of lightnings and the, even the intensity of the lightnings, although we don't really understand at this point the details of a uh, possible connection. So let me show you the effect on airplanes. So this is a small clip that you will see now, uh, which shows an airplane taking off from uh, Kamatsu Air Force Base in Japan, and it is being, you know, hit by lightning, even though, you know, uh, the actual title of this slide is actually justifiably lightning initiation by an aircraft because this actually this uh, is it's not like the uh, airplane is actually crossing the path of uh, lightning but it is actually creating its own lightning and you can see that and we'll stop this for a second i hope you can see the the mouse the i mean the cursor uh, I'm, I'm showing here what comes out of the nose of the aircraft in the you can see here that this lightning is like a tree and it has branches and this is a typical thing for lightning and the branches the actual the branching is upward the fact that the branching is upward from out of the nose of the airplane it implies it shows that the lightning actually was initiated from the nose of the of the uh, airplane and the same thing happens from the tail uh, for the discharge that goes down, you know, it branches downward and that uh, indicates that this discharge was actually, that this lower part of the discharge was initiated from the airplane also, but going down. So this is uh, something that we will be using also in this presentation in other places to see if a lightning is going, you know, what, what the direction of the lightning is basically. So let me go to the next uh, slide uh, where I show, you know, cattle, you know, that are killed by normally by step voltage. So the, this is a typical thing. I mean, that for, for more cattle actually get killed than human beings uh, yearly. Uh, yearly, the number of deaths in the world is about, I mean, it's a few, a few thousand. It could be up to 20,000. It depends on the year and depends on the reports that you see. But there is also death, you know, of cattle, not even of human beings as, a, as an effect. Now, uh, let me now talk about the types of lightning. I'm going to go to the basically the major types of lightning. You can see here uh, uh, lightning. I mean, let me just read what says it across the bottom here. A complete lightning is called a lightning flash. The lightning is actually a complex phenomenon that is composed of many processes, and the whole the whole lightning is called a lightning flash. It's composed of many processes that we usually don't see because it happens so quickly. We we can't really distinguish them. Uh, now we have uh, four types of lightning essentially. One of them, which is the one that uh, is shown here up on the upper left part of this figure. It's called cloud to sky lightning. Uh, it's also called, it has other names, you know, the uh, transient luminous events, uh, 
this happens from, uh, upward from the cloud. Then we have uh, the second type of lightning, which is the lightning that's called cloud to ground lightning. That's the one that goes from charge centers in the cloud to the ground and makes contact with the ground. We have uh, a third type, which is called intra-cloud. In the intra-cloud lightning, you don't really see the channel here because it's happening inside the cloud. That's what the intra-cloud means. You have different charge centers within a cloud and then the discharge happens between them. And if you have a discharge that happens between charge centers that are located in two different clouds, then you have the type that's called inter-cloud. But the one that has been studied the most, because it is the most important for human beings, and because it's uh, maybe easier to study because it hits the ground closer to us, is this cloud to ground lightning. And we'll go, we're going to be concentrating mostly on this one actually in this presentation. So you see here uh, uh, the types of cloud to ground lightning. I mean, in, uh, what I'm showing here is actually not all the types of cloud to ground lightning. I wanted to just illustrate first uh, what you see here, which is a cloud. This is a diagram of a cloud. And you have a lightning, this lightning on the left, which is actually a downward lightning. And you can tell by the same criterion that we used when we were uh, talking about the airplane, because you have the branching that is happening downward. So this shows you that this lightning is actually a downward lightning. And then you have also, according to the direction of propagation, you have upward lightning. That's the case on the right, where you see the branching going upward. And this will eventually, I mean, uh, if it succeeds, to, it, will, it will reach the cloud and it will make contact with the with the cloud. You can see here, uh, I will point out something that we'll be using also <coughs> in, excuse me, in other parts of the presentation. It is the fact that we have this model of the cloud, which has a, a tripole with a negative, a big negative charge here, a big positive charge at the top, and then a small you know, pocket of positive charge at the bottom of the cloud. Now, lightning then, because uh, if we are based our classification only on the direction of propagation of the of the discharge, the actually the initial direction of propagation, we can say that there's downward and that there is upward. However, you know these two types can uh, transfer either positive or negative charge to the ground. So if you have a, a lightning that is that could be downward and transferring positive, or you have down downward transferring negative. And the same thing for the for the upward. And this gives us actually having positive, negative, upward, downward, it gives us four types of lightning that are shown now in this uh, slide. So we have uh, basically four types here, you know, one, two, three, four. I'm going to start with the upper left, uh, just to uh, show you that in this case, we have a downward negative lightning, you already know because I've said this several times that the branching tells you that it's going down. And also uh, you see that there is negative charge in this channel uh, indicating that this lightning is lowering because it's moving down. It's lowering negative charge to the ground. And that makes it because it's actually the sign of the charge that is moved to the ground effectively, what gives you the sign. So you have a downward negative flash here. I'm going to continue with the second one, uh, which is actually, I'm, I'm gonna go down the one right beneath it. This one here is downward because of the branching and it is positive because it is going down with a positive charge. So it is charged positively, it's lowering positive charge to the ground. It's a little more, I mean, maybe it can be sometimes a little confusing, but the, the one on the, if, if you look at the upper right type here, you will see that this one is upward because it branches upward. It has actually a positive channel, but it is a negative lightning. And the reason is that simply that you are moving up positive charge up, which is effectively moving negative charge down. And it's actually the transfer from the cloud to the ground that gives the sign of the lightning. This one is a, an upward negative because it goes up and it lowers effectively negative charge to the ground. And uh, we, when you look at this upward on the, this is the last one here, so that you have an upward lightning and it is positive because it's uh, actually move, it seems to be moving negative charges up, which is equivalent, equivalent to moving negative charges down. That's why this one is an upward positive lightning. So let's look now 
something that's interesting here, which is the, uh, the percentages of these uh, lightning. So the 90% of all the cloud to ground lightning around the world is uh, of this type of downward negative type. So this is 90% about, about 90%. The, the word about is important here because uh, when I say here that about 10% uh, or less is cloud to ground uh, is this type, you know, this the, the type of downward positive. This makes already 100%, so it doesn't give a lot of percentage to the ones on the right, but it is about actually because the, the actually the upward lightning itself is uh, this upward lightning occurs only from tall objects which are 100 meters tall or so, or or taller actually, and uh, also from objects that are shorter than 100 meters but are installed on, for example, or, or erected on mountains. This is less than one percent of the lightning. Much less than one percent is uh, this upper lightning. But this upper lightning is nevertheless very important actually nowadays especially because we have a lot of uh, wind turbines and uh, you know communication towers so we have uh, uh, the number of upper lightning is actually increasing and it is actually it damages for example some of the wind turbines and towers that i mentioned uh, so it is important for lightning protection now let's uh, look at the cloud actually the i'm, I'm going to take the cloud itself and the, with this model i make it a little bigger here i'm going to make it even bigger now and I'm going to show you what happens inside to see how the actual charge separation happens, or at least the theory that is mostly accepted right now. So what you see here is uh, within the cloud, different types of particles uh, that are called hydrometeors. There are many more than what I'm showing, but these are the ones that appear to be uh, the, the ones that are responsible for charge separation. And this is also in the presence of super cool water and other things, but uh, simplifying matters, you can, uh, let's say, identify the mechanism that discharge, that, that, that separates charge in the cloud using these two types of particles. One of them is ice crystals and the other one is grapple, which is some form of sleet. Uh, the, in the cloud, you have wind, actually, updrafts usually coming, you know, winds going up. These updrafts make some of these uh, particles uh, fall and the other ones rise actually depending on their on their weight and the and the geometry and what happens is that you have the heavier grapple going down and the uh, crystals going up and when they collide then they there is a, an exchange of charge and you get ice crystals charged positively and uh, the grapple charged negatively and that makes the i mean positive charge be at the top because these are lighter and go up, and uh, negative charge at the bottom. And something interesting happens because when you do these uh, collisions in the laboratory, you realize that depending on the temperature, actually the exchange of charges is the opposite. So if you go, for example, to higher temperatures than minus 15 Celsius or so, the when you have the collisions, notice that the charge change now, the crystals, the ice crystals get actually charged negatively. And this makes actually in the cloud have this structure which is positive at the top, negative in the middle, and positive at the at the bottom. So this is what gives this tripole structure of the cloud. Let's go back to the cloud itself and to the original, uh, I mean, the drawing that I showed with the four types of lightning. And we're going to do the following. We're going to concentrate now on the most common type of lightning, which is this one, which is 90% of the cloud to ground lightning. And we're going to look at how the some of the processes that happen in this uh, type of lightning. This is the lightning that you, we have all seen, actually, you know, the downward negative lightning. We have also seen the downward positive, but the, the most most of the time is downward negative that we see. So we have a, a time axis here. Well, this is what we're going to be doing is going starting here and going uh, as the time increases. I'm going to show you what happens, you know, uh, with uh, the downward negative lightning. And then we will continue here in the second axis and then continue in the third axis. So here we have this cloud in the ground at time t equals zero. So at some point we start to have one discharge, which is uh, happens between the positive pocket of charge at the bottom and the negative charge in the middle of the cloud. And this discharge is called the preliminary discharge. It's 
We don't see this discharge actually, but uh, it happens between those two. And, uh, and then pretty soon after that, we have a discharge that emerges from the bottom of the cloud and it will go down in a stepwise manner. This is interesting because it doesn't go continuously, it steps. Uh, so you can see that you, you have already 1.2 milliseconds and it keeps going down. This is called the stepped leader. So this discharge, which is fairly faint, and you can see it at night and sometimes at, during the day too, but sometimes you can't really see it because it's relatively faint. Uh, this discharge progresses to the ground and it starts to branch. So there are branches going down. And at a time of a couple of, maybe maybe 20 milliseconds or so, you start to get uh, closer to the ground with this stepping discharge, which transfers a negative charge towards the ground. And then you have from pointy objects uh, or sharp objects on the ground, you start to have upward discharges. These uh, objects could be towers, it could be uh, trees, it could be people, it could be animals. And you can have uh, even, yeah, uh, in any any tall, uh, not necessarily tall, but a little sharp object, or even sometimes if you don't have any, it could be even on the ground itself. That you have upward discharges, which are called upward connecting discharges. And as time progresses, at some point, at about 20 milliseconds, you have uh, uh, a connection, and this connection is called the attachment process. Now we have something spectacular actually that happens because as soon as you have this uh, attachment, then you have a very fast, high current, intense pulse of current that goes up at the at speeds that are of one third to two thirds the speed of light. And that one is called the first return stroke. That's the one that we really see actually because it lights up the channel because the current is very high. It lights up the channel and it even makes the channel temperature go up higher or well, let's say a temperature similar to the temperatures that we see on the surface of the sun. So the first return stroke reaches the cloud. And uh, once it reaches the cloud, interestingly, uh, something that we don't probably know necessarily, I mean, the lightning seems to stop and it may stop actually there. But in, on average, it doesn't stop there. On average, tens of milliseconds later, I mean, the current can stop, and then some tens of milliseconds later, sometimes it's maybe 100 or 200 milliseconds later, you start to have another leader coming down. This one is not uh, a stepping leader most of the time. It is called the dark leader, and it is continuously moving leader that goes down at a speed that is about 10 times the speed of the uh, step leader. And once it reaches the ground, you have another return stroke. This one is called the subsequent return stroke. And uh, the subsequent return stroke goes all the way up to the cloud. In this, the sequence of leader return stroke, you know, leader return stroke, this sequence can repeat several times. So on average it's like from three to five times. Uh, it can be more times, of course, but uh, with, this tells you is that basically when lightning strikes once, it actually strikes several times on average, the same place. And uh, the, um, the whole thing, as I said before, is called a flash. So you can see this, which happens mostly in the summer, because in the summer you have a tendency to see more leader return stroke sequences. So in the summer, you will see that the lightning flickers. If you take a look at the lightning at night, for example, once or during the day also, in the summer, you will see a flickering of the lightning. And this flickering comes from the fact that you have several return strokes, one after another. Let me show you now a video from Tom Warner uh, that shows a few of these processes. So here you see the step leader. This is a, a high-speed, uh, video. I'm in a camera. And that was the leader that they have the attachment process and then you have the return stroke. So the return stroke is really the thing that illuminates uh, the channel. This was uh, about the whole thing lasted actually in reality about a half a second, but it was slowed down some 250 times. 
Uh, so those were three processes, the step leader, the attachment process, and the return stroke, but there are other processes. Some of them I showed before, some of them I didn't. Let me show you here the preliminary breakdown I showed. These three we saw also, and these other three processes, not. I mean, the continuing current, M components and interstroke processes in the that happen in the cloud. Or they have these other basically K and J changes, they're called, or K and J processes. Uh, what I would like to show you now is, I mean, I, I haven't talked about these three. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you much about them, except that I will show you that some of them can be measured at the channel, at the base of the channel. If you can measure the current at the base of a lightning, and I'm going to show you then amplitudes of the currents, typical amplitudes and things like that. And this is a this is a schematic of, of what you would see if you measure the lightning at the at the base, if you could measure the lightning at the bottom of the channel. So you would see basically you don't see the leader. Remember that the leader, the step leader comes from the cloud, but it hasn't reached the, the ground. So you can't really measure it at the ground as a current. So, but what you see is uh, this uh, big pulse, which is a return stroke. It's the one that really moves up and heats up the channel at temperatures that are uh, of the order of the temperatures on the surface of the sun. And after that, you may or may not have, after the return stroke, you may or may not have something called the, continu the continuing current, actually. The continuing current, CC, is actually this, the, the, it's a current that goes, uh, I mean, it's relatively slow, and it has pulses superimposed on it, which are called M components. Uh, after the cessation of the current, when the current, when the first return stroke uh, ends, you can have then a period of no current, and that is followed by, you know, if you remember, there was another leader that was the dot leader going down, and then you have a subsequent return stroke. The subsequent return stroke may or may not have a continuum current, which may or may not have also these M components. And then I show here a third return stroke, which does not have this continuing current. So to show you maybe the scales here, the return stroke is last, uh, it's in the order of 100 microseconds. The, this is the same thing for the, another return stroke. The continuing current uh, lasts for hundreds of milliseconds. So it's tens to hundreds of milliseconds. The amplitudes here are as follows. So you have the first return stroke, which has an amplitude, typical amplitude of 30 kiloamperes. The subsequent return strokes have a typical amplitude of about 10 to 12 kiloamps. I mean, it's a typical, it's very highly variable actually. And then the continuing current is this slow current here, uh, which actually lasts for, as I said, tens to hundreds of milliseconds, so it can be can do damage, even though it's only tens to hundreds of amps, sometimes a thousand amps, it's very highly variable too. But the, the, this current can do a lot of damage. It can actually ignite fires, for example, because it's, it transfers a lot of charge. Even though it's lower, it's slow, and, but it is actually, it lasts much longer than the return stroke, for example. The M components are hundreds of amps in amplitude. So this is uh, basically uh, the, the currents, and, but it is, this is not the only effect of lightning. As you know, you know lightning is a, it's a very big antenna because it's the, the path length, as I said at the beginning, and the definition is measured in kilometers. So you can have uh, this, well, we've got this beautiful picture of a lightning with a lot of branching. And because it's an antenna and it has big currents that uh, propagate through this big antenna, you also have electromagnetic fields, and these electromagnetic fields can be measured at, of course, very close to the lightning, but they can also be measured easily at 100 kilometers, a few hundred kilometers, and the low frequency components can even go around the Earth ionosphere waveguide and go around the Earth, you know, several times. Uh, so you can measure, measure them uh, very far. Let me show you the shapes of the of these fields. So what I'm showing here, because it's a lot of information, uh, this comes from a classical paper by Linedal in 1979. Uh, I'm going to ask you to concentrate on one at a time, let's say. But first of all, let me overall tell you that on the left, you have the, the left plots, uh, the, the three plots on the left. They are uh, 
related to the, they are the electric field actually intensity and on the right you see the magnetic field you notice that there are there are two plots you know one with a solid line and the other one with a dashed line so the the solid line is for first return strokes and the dashed line is for subsequent return strokes and uh, you can see the time scale at the bottom so here you are, you have basically from 0 to 170 microseconds and you notice that there are some characteristics of the lightning at one kilometer, two kilometers, and five kilometers. So we will see in the next slide what happens when you go farther away. But in this case, it's interesting because uh, the lightning actually is, the, the wave shapes are very different if you are close to the lightning or far away from the lightning. In this case, for example, you have, well, you have this, um, um, you have this, um, amplitude uh, scale here of one kilovolt per meter but what you see with what, what's but special also about the electric field when you're very close is that you have a ramp you have a ramp here this is a typical thing for closed fields that you have this this ramp in the magnetic field you have a hump here and notice that the fields yeah they are fairly different to, from each other. I mean, that you, when you look at the electric and the magnetic field, you could, in principle, I'm not sure if this has been done before, but you could, in principle, for example, take these shapes that are very different. You feed them, for example, to a machine learning algorithm that would maybe tell you the distance to the lightning. But this, these differences are uh, actually they vary with, uh, with distance. And this brings me actually to the next slide in which I will show you more distant lightning and something that happens that's also interesting so this is 10 kilometers also again the electric fields on the left and the magnetic fields on the right and uh, you notice that uh, as you go to for, uh, 200 kilometers 50 kilometers already the, the the electric field has some shape and the magnetic field has the same shape actually they, they're actually the same shape exactly the same shape this is predicted by Maxwell's equations because these are actually radiation components only of the fields, so they have the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other, and and uh, and they have uh, identical shapes. Uh, the scales you can see here also, and then yeah, you can see 200 kilometers, and then and uh, uh, let's say well for about this uh, the the fields that this is just to illustrate the the types of fields that you can measure, and the, these fields of course they also coupled to power lines and they can create uh, problems also by coupling just to different electrical circuits, for example. Um, the zero, the, the, what I wanted to show here was that when you have some zero crossing here when you are at 50 kilometers or farther, then you don't, you have basically, you know, the integral of the field is zero and the shapes are the same, electric and magnetic. So this, that's all I wanted to say about downward lightning. I'm going to talk about upward lightning now. Remember that upward lightning is the one that happens only from tall objects. So only from tall objects or from objects of moderate, moderate height uh, on mountains. This lightning is becoming more frequent now because even though it uh, was fairly rare, now uh, because of uh, what I mentioned about the fact that we have wind turbine parks and then we have towers uh, that are uh, erected in different places for telecommunications, for example, you, we have more lightning of this type because it only comes from tall objects. Above a certain height, tall structures will actually produce their own upward lightning. I mean, this is what really happens. This upward lightning is not really lightning that's being attracted to tall structures. But it is lightning that is being created by the fact that the tall structure is present. So in a way, you will have more lightning if you have a tall structure near wherever you live, for example. There will be more lightning happening. So this is the picture of the upward lightning that we showed before. We have upward negative and upward positive lightning. And uh, I'm going to show you now an upward positive lightning. This is a video that was taken in here in Switzerland from a tower that I will be mentioning a little, a little later, a tower called the Sentis Tower. So you can see the high-speed video image here of an upward positive lightning. 
it's gonna go back now in in time. This is just to illustrate what it looks like. And now we have fast reverse, so it's just coming back. It's the same thing. You see how the lightning develops and then comes back. So let me show you now this upper lightning, how it works actually. I, I couldn't find a, a better tower. I'm not really sure when I when I se selected this image for this tower, it looks like, I'm not sure if it's the Eiffel Tower or, or maybe the like a tower that you would see in an oil field. But in any case, you have the cloud here and schematically I'm going to show you what happens and related to the current plot that you see here on the right. So you can see here that there basically it, it appears to be three parts. This one here, I'm not sure if you are seeing actually the, uh, the, the mouse that I'm going around in the one that says ICC pulses here. So the, this first part, then you have a second part and a third part. In fact, there is actually two parts uh, because the last two are return strokes. So the first part is something that characterizes the and that's it's actually special about upper upward lightning. Let me show you how that works. So what you have is a discharge going up. This is a, the an initial continuous continuous current. This is the ICC that you see here, and it's a dashed line here. This current is very similar to the continuing current that we showed before for downward lightning, but the the, the continuing current in in uh, and downward lightning happens after return stroke. In this case, we start with this initial continuous current. And uh, on top of it, there are these pulses that you see here. So um, the, this lights up the channel, basically. The, the, each one of these pulses lights up the channel. And it, it, you can see an intensification of the channel luminosity when each one of these pulses appears. And there can be many of these, which are called ICC pulses or initial continuous current pulses. Then we have the current that stops. So this is, we are here right now. If you are seeing the mouse, you can see that the, light, the, the, the current stops. And then in, uh, not in all the lightnings, in many upper lightnings, this is the end of the lightning, but in some of the upper lightnings, uh, after this stops, you have a downward leader that I'm showing now and a return stroke that goes up. And this return stroke is what you see here. This return stroke may be followed by a, continuing current like a, like for downward lightning and it may also have this m component pulses or it may not also there could be a second return stroke here for example without this continuing current so i'm telling you many things i am sure it's not uh, very hard to remember all these things that's not the idea I, just to you know make you aware of the complexity of this and that the fact that these types of figures exist that will allow you to understand what is happening at the bottom of the channel and this lightning is also similar to what happens when you when lightning is created from airplanes for example so you, you could use these for example to improve protection of circuits devices airplanes or systems so the time scales here are the tens to hundreds of milliseconds for the initial continuous current and so the continuing current and it's of the order of 100 microseconds for the return strokes, similar to downward lightning. The amplitudes are also similar to, to downward lightning, a little lower actually in upward lightning. So uh, let me go to the next point, which is how are lightning measurements made? You know, given the fact that uh, it is a random process, you don't know where it's going to strike and uh, or when it's going to strike. And it's also intrinsically a, a very harsh electromagnetic environment if you're going to measure the currents directly, for example, or if you're going to measure very close by. So it's the, the techniques that are used are um, so very interesting. You, you, to measure directly the channel-based current, you can create lightning artificially using small rockets. This is called rocket trigger lightning or you know, rocket and wire, the rocket and wire method. You can, in principle, use lasers also, but this is not, I mean, there have been attempts for many decades now to create uh, lightning using a laser. And currently there is a project uh, that uh, will use a terawatt laser. It's not the most powerful, it's not the most, most powerful laser that exists nowadays, but it does have more energy in its, uh, in its beam. 
to, to the, but it will be tried next summer to uh, try to trigger lightning here in Switzerland. And then you can also use instrumented tall grounded objects. If you can you can use, for example, buildings like the Empire State Building was used already to measure lightning that strikes it. You can use towers, you can use wind turbines. So let me show you first this uh, rocket trigger lightning technique. So what you see here is a launcher, and this was in Florida uh, and Camp Landing. This unfortunately uh, is not active at this time because of lack of funding. Uh, at least temporarily it uh, has stopped uh, its operation, but you have a launcher here and you have the, these small rockets here, which can be maybe one meter, or meter and a half. In, they're plastic, they have a, a you know, wire winding here. Uh, what, what is done is that one end of this winding is attached to the ground, and then when the conditions are correct, the rocket is launched and the wire unwinds as the rocket goes up. When you reach an altitude of a couple of hundred meters or so, then lightning is produced. The lightning that is very similar to natural lightning, except for the fact that you don't have a first return stroke. You only have subsequent return strokes. Let me show you a video of uh, an actual lightning and cam blending. Uh, this one uh, is in, uh, no, I'm not sure if this one is cam, uh, yeah, it is in cam blending. Sorry. So, so this is a, um, a rocket you will hear, hopefully, the audio too. So, four, three, two, one, fire. You could hear the lightning and you could hear also the scientists who were uh, cheerfully, you know, screaming because many times you, know, you have to wait for many weeks uh, to for the conditions to be right to produce the lightning. Sometimes you launch the rocket and you don't produce the lightning and then the rocket just falls back down to the ground. But in this case, it just goes up and it vaporizes this wire uh, instantaneously and the, the, this allows uh, scientists to place sensors uh, at the bottom of the channel to measure the currents, and you can also place all kinds of other sensors like optical sensors and uh, you know, nowadays X-ray sensors and stuff like that uh, also. So let's uh, go to tall grounded objects, which is another way to measure lightning. This is the one we use in Switzerland. And you can see here a number of towers uh, around the world. So this is the Eagle Nest Tower, which is in Spain. It's only 25 meters tall. It's in the Pyrenees, close to the it's uh, close to the French border. We have the Morro do Cachimbo, which is the tower in Brazil. The Geisberg Tower uh, in Austria. The Sentis Tower in Switzerland, uh, and uh, the Peisenberg Tower in Germany. The CN Tower in Toronto. You may know this one, and also this one, the Sky Tree Tower, which is very tall in uh, in Tokyo, in Japan. Oh, no, uh, the the tower that we have in Switzerland is actually this one. I mean, all of them have they are special in many ways. And, and the, the, what's special about the Sentis Tower is that this tower is struck by lightning consistently over 100 times a year. This makes it effectively a life-size laboratory to measure lightning. So this is a picture of the of the tower that was instrumented by the. EPFL, so the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and the HSSO, the University of Applied Sciences and Arts Western Switzerland, it about 10 years ago, so since 2010. And it has the highest lightning incidence, you know, over 100 a year, like I mentioned, the highest in Switzerland, the highest in Western Europe, and perhaps, I mean, at least as far as instrumented towers, maybe the highest in the world, and it is consistent, which is consistently more than 100 times a year for over 10 years, which is really something very impressive and it has allowed us to have even the database that is the largest database on pulses uh, associated with upper lightning in, uh, in the world. I mean, in just a few years we obtained that. So let me show you one picture of it with sensors. We have two types of sensors. We have Rogowski coils and, uh, and B dot sensors to measure magnetic fields and to measure the current. And we have at, these at two different heights. So I'm not going to say much more about this, uh, except for the fact that it's a beautiful site. You can visit it, actually, if you come to Switzerland, hopefully when the COVID situation improves. 
uh, you can it's a it's a tourist attraction too so you can come here and see the tower itself it's a it's a, it's a really great site it's a, on a mountain that is 2500 meters tall and the tower itself is 123.5 meters tall let me say, show you now how lightning fields are measured so fields from lightning can be measured with different types of antennas. You can just use a whip antenna, you know, like a dipole antenna, for example, or a monopole antenna to measure. But typically, excuse me, what is used is this type of antenna, which is called a flat plate sensor. So you have a metallic box that can be uh, of this shape, or it could also be, you know, like a, a cylinder. And uh, you, you take a disc and you cut it out. So this is a cut out disc. And then you replace it, even though this is green, this is actually also the metallic disc that it's put back, but you don't have a galvanic connection, a direct galvanic connection between the box and the cut out disc. What you do is you make a connection inside the box. So inside the box, there is a connection through uh, an amplifier that allows you to, on the one hand, to measure the charge transfer from this disc to the rest of the box which is usually grounded. And on the other hand, to process it by integrating, because it turns out that the field, the electric fields are proportional to the integral of the currents that go between the disk and the and the meta and the, the rest of the of the box. So this is called a flat plate antenna and it will be used, it has been used in lightning research for many, many years. Uh, the magnetic field typically is measured using just a loop. Now, do we have a couple of loops here that are perpendicular, and each loop will measure either the east-west or the north-east, uh, or what did I say, north-south, sorry, east-west uh, uh, component of the magnetic field, I mean, depending on how you're oriented, of course. I mean, you will get, in any case, the whole vector magnetic field, because the magnetic field from lightning is horizontal. So to measure that, we use these two loops. Let me show you now uh, uh, real, uh, these are real antennas from the EPFL. So this is a flat plate antenna. The, the, the shape of the box here is uh, cylindrical. And this is the cutout disc. Inside you have the amplifier that connects it, or you can also take the signal out, the current out and amplify outside. Uh, and then you have the two, magnetic loops. There are other ways to measure the more sophisticated ways of measuring the magnetic field, for example, using something called the B-dot sensor, that, which is what's installed on the Sentis tower, uh, that will uh, increase the bandwidth and have better performance than these the simple loops, but the simple loops work as well. So uh, that was for measurements of fields and currents we saw before also. And now I'm going to show you uh, and this is, will be actually the end of the presentation, how lightning is detected and located. There are many ways of doing it. I mean, I'm showing you a few of them here, and we're going to be concentrating only on the first four. So one of them that can be used by anyone, you don't need any equipment at all, you can use it to locate lightning yourselves. And then you have uh, two more that are currently used usually in combination in commercial lightning location systems, and one that is an emerging technology that has not been used for commercial purposes yet. So let's look at this well-known patented uh, time to thunder technique. And this, what you see here is an observer, and uh, that would be you, uh, and then you have a lightning, and when lightning strikes, you know, light comes out of the lightning uh, and you can see the light and then you can hear the thunder. Of course, you know, the speed of light is about a, a million times faster than the higher than the speed of sound. So that basically when you see the lightning, that means the light got to you, to your eyes. That's the moment when the thunder detaches from the channel. Uh, the, if you start counting the seconds, you somehow count, you can also count by just counting one, two, three, four, you have to estimate the number of seconds until you hear the thunder, then you will have the time that the thunder took to reach you. And uh, this time, because we know the speed of sound, can be used to determine the distance. So the distance, I mean, if you take into account the fact that the speed of light is about one third of a kilometer per second, you have uh, basically that the distance in kilometers 
well, the distance will be the number of seconds times the speed of sound, but the, the number of kilometers is just the number of seconds divided by three. That's a, a good estimation of the distance to the lightning. So if you measure, if you see the lightning and you count up to 30 before you hear the thunder, the thunder, so that means the lightning was about 10 kilometers away. You can use the same thing, but dividing by, dividing by five if you want to get it in an estimate in miles. So this is the simplest technique that many of you already knew probably, uh, if not all of you. Uh, now I'm going to go to the ones that are used in commercial systems. And I'm not going to go through all of the ones that are used in commercial systems, only the, maybe the most popular ones, uh, let's say the most, the, the, the most widely spread techniques, which are the one called direction finding, which is based on the following. This is the principle. So you have a lightning, these are return strokes, you saw that flickering there. In the, each one you have a return stroke, you have a field, an electric field and a magnetic field that uh, actually propagate. And the magnetic field is perpendicular when you are at the, far from the lightning, or far enough from the lightning. The magnetic field will be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And so if you knew, if you could measure the magnetic field, if you could measure the direction of the magnetic field, you would know the direction to the lightning, because the direction to the lightning is perpendicular to it. I mean, I'm showing only one direction here. It could be in the other direction too. But if you have two ways, I mean, two places where you measure the fields, you have these two loops to measure the magnetic field and two loops elsewhere. In each case, you will know the direction to the lightning. And then the place where these two lines cross is where the lightning strike point was. This is, of course, theoretical, and it, in practice, it does work, although uh, there are some errors that come from different reasons that I'm not going to go into here. Uh, but but uh, you can use you know, more than two, or you can, uh, the, or you can combine this, which is really what is done nowadays, to, with, uh, with the next technique to obtain good estimates, very good estimates of the location of the lightning. So the next technique is the time of arrival technique, which is called TOA or sometimes DTOA because it's the difference in time of arrival that is actually used. This is a new, another technique then. And it is based on hyperbolic branches. I mean, it, I'm going to show you here first, nothing related to lightning. It's just two focal points and one point. And if you take all the points that satisfy the condition that the difference in the distances to these focal points, so those, those two dashed lines are the, the straight lines, if you measure those lines, you get distances to the focal points. All the points that satisfy the condition that the difference in the distance to these focal points is constant, they produce two hyperbolic branches. So it, this is the definition of a hyperbola, actually one of the definitions of the hyperbola, a hyperbola geometrically. So this can be applied to lightning in the following way. So if you have now in this difference in time of arrival technique, you have one sensor here and a second sensor here. Then if a lightning strikes where the cross is, that's the lightning strike point, the distance, the difference in the distance to the two sensors, which would be now the focal points corresponding to the previous slide, the difference in the distances is proportional to the difference in the times of arrival of the waves because the speed of propagation is constant and it is equal to the speed of light. This will create then also two hyperbolas showing you all the points where the lightning strike point could be just by measuring the difference in time of arrival of the wave that um, the pulse that comes from the return stroke to each one of the sensors. I'm going to get rid of one of these uh, branches and I'm going to add one more sensor because we need an intersection of curves to find the location of the lightning. So between two and three, sensors two and three, you also have a time difference of arrival of a, of a signal and that creates two more branches. So the intersection that you see here is the location of the lightning. So use, by using three sensors, we can find the location, although you must realize that, uh, and you'll see this red arrow here, it shows that there are two possible locations, actually. This satisfies also the same uh, time difference of arrival for sensors one and two and simultaneously two and three. So you need to find a way to get rid of this ambiguity and this can be done by using a fourth sensor, for example, or combining this with uh, time of uh, 
with the direction finding or some other technique. So this is the one that, uh, that was the second technique. And I'm going now to the last technique and the last point of this presentation. This is an emerging lightning location system technology, which is called time reversal. So uh, time reversal invariance refers to the property of some, in fact, I should have written here many, because many of the laws of physics, they remain invariant under the what's called the T symmetry transformation, meaning that if you change T to minus T, if you, you can make the phenomenon basically go backwards in time. You're not really making it go backwards in time, in time, of course, but you can make the, for example, uh, an object that it was moving in a certain way, you can make it move, uh, retrace the path that it actually went through in the recent path. Past. So, so basically, this same thing can be applied to Maxwell's equations under certain conditions. And by using that, you can use it to waves, actually, wave propagation. And this has led to the technique I'm going to show you. I'm not going into the mathematics of the time reversal here, uh, but I'm going to just show you how the technique is applied. So look at the, the way the technique is applied. This is, the, this is called EMTR, you know, electromagnetic time reversal technique. So that's why it's called EMTR. And what you have here is a cloud. You see the ground, uh, which is gray, and four sets of sensors that can measure the magnetic field or the electric field too. Uh, you can use actually, it's actually better to use the, the electric field and for a reason that I'm not going to go into here, but the magnetic field works well too. So you have a, a leader and then you have a return stroke and this will produce a pulse because this return stroke, I remind you, is a fast pulse, fast and high current pulse. So it will create basically uh, these pulses that will reach the different sensors. And then if you record the field at each one of the sensors, and then if you take this field that has been just recorded and you time reverse it, and time reversing it means that you basically flip it in time. You know, if you flip it in time, and what all I did here was to take these wave shapes and flip them, you know, front to back, and then you re-inject the pulses. It turns out that when you re-inject them, not using antennas, but by simulation, you can re-inject them. If you know the characteristics of the antennas and of the medium, you just re-inject them by simulation. They will propagate back and they will concentrate. They will. They will. Uh, basically interfere constructively in a maximum way at the point of the, uh, I mean, the, at the strike point of the lightning. And this allows you by simulation to locate the lightning and it gives you uh, a higher accuracy than the techniques that I showed before, which were the direction finding and, um, and the difference in time of arrival. So this technique, uh, as I said, has not been implemented in commercial systems. We have uh, applied for funding for several years already. We are waiting now in a few weeks. We will hear if we get funding from the European Commission for, uh, for a project that would allow us to, in the context of a bigger objective actually, to actually produce more, uh, such a system uh, to locate discharges within the cloud. So the maximum point of constructive interference will give you the, as I said before, the location of the lightning. Uh, I want to finish the presentation by showing you pictures of the people who have participated in the CENTIS project team. The CENTIS is the source of data that we use for lightning, uh, for direct, direct measurements. And you have here people who, like uh, the first one there uh, is Carlos Romero, who was a PhD student who actually instrumented the, the tower. He, he was the one who built the sensors and and went up the tower and instrumented it. And then there's the, like this few people here, a sequence of uh, uh, students, uh, former students and also professors, like Professor uh, Davide Pavanello in the bottom row, Mario Paolone, that's myself, and Professor Farah Rashidi, who is actually the the locomotive actually that has led all this uh, all this effort uh, throughout the years. So with this, I would like to I finish here the presentation and I will try to answer any questions uh, you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Marcos, for a very interesting presentation. So let's proceed to the question and answer session. Uh, I have few questions uh, on the list. 
the first question is uh, yeah, this is maybe interesting question. So uh, somebody asked Professor, can we store lightning for making electricity? Uh, that's a that, that's a very good question and, and actually a very common question. Actually, can we store actually the energy in the lightning? Well, the, it turns out that the, there are several reasons why we probably can't do that. We cannot do that. And uh, the reason is that well, the actual the actual energy that would be available at the base of the channel from one lightning would be enough to light up a light bulb maybe for a, for a month or so. Uh, so it's not so much energy actually. You could if you know, I mean that you, we have 50 to 100 lightning flashes per second around the world. So if we could actually store all the energy, we might be able to do something, but you you don't know where it's, stri it's going to strike most of the time. And, uh, and also you would have to store all the energy and take it to the same place basically or like somehow combine all the energy, then it is not really practical. Uh, let's say, I will say at this time, but it doesn't look optimistic if I may be honest. All right. Uh, the second question is related is also um, is related to the safety precautions. So uh, the question is, is there any safety precautions installed in cities to absorb the lightning to avoid any damage while striking on humans? Oh, the precautions for human humans. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. You know, like the the, the number of deaths actually uh, has been decreasing with uh, time because people are aware uh, of what they need to do. When you, when you see lightning, or when you basically when you use this technique I spoke about, where you count the number of seconds, if you just hear the lightning, I and mean, if you hear, for example, 30 seconds after the you see it, then you are probably too close and then you, you might be the victim of the next lightning. So what you have to always do is to just go inside a car, for example, inside a structure, a building, and which they have, which has a, a, I mean, a normal building, not, not just a wooden shack or something like that, but a, a buildings normally have metallic structures and even explicitly sometimes, or many times, uh, they have uh, metallic uh, parts and lightning protection. This is the thing you need to do. I mean, if you are outside, you may have heard this also. If you're outside and you can't find a building where you can uh, be safe in, then uh, what you need to do is basically you need to you could uh, squat down, uh, not get under a tree. If you get under an isolated tree, for example, you, then you risk uh, being uh, struck. I indirectly by the lightning when the lightning strikes the tree. You should not lie down. That's one thing. I mean, lying down is not a good idea because uh, of the step voltage. I mean, squatting down is a good idea. Uh, what else can I tell you? So there are these are maybe the basic uh, the basic uh, precautions. I mean, yeah. In some special cases, some people ask. I mean, can you get into a swimming pool? It's not a good idea. Uh, but if you follow some basic uh, rules, you have a lower chance of uh, being uh, struck by lightning. One last thing maybe uh, that I should mention is that contrary to what many people may think, uh, most people who get struck by lightning survive, actually. Most, I mean, like maybe 80% or so. And uh, what can happen is that uh, uh, if the lightning doesn't really burn your nerves or your brain, which, which can happen depending on on the, how strong the lightning was, or if it has this continuing current that I mentioned before or not. If the person actually is unconscious or has, a, for example, uh, stops breathing, then you need to do CPR on the person and you can save the person. Most people actually get saved. They don't get big burns actually either uh, from, from a lightning. All right. Um, the next question is related to the, um, uh, the one of the comment I think in the on the presentation that you have mentioned the presentation that lightning is a huge antenna. So can you elaborate it more? Yeah, the lightning is a, yeah it's a, it's a big antenna because it is a, a, a few kilometers long, 
and uh, you have basically an injection of a fast current at the bottom when you have the process that, I, that the return stroke, the one that goes up the channel with tens of kiloamps in amplitude. And uh, this makes this antenna actually uh, be efficient for radiation at some frequencies and the frequency in the frequencies in the order of, for example, kilohertz and megahertz, you can go, you can go very, very far. Uh, that's why I was mentioning also that even for very low frequencies, you can, you know, frequencies of a few hertz, you have, uh, you can have lightning actually, like a combination of the different lightnings that happen around the world. Uh, they can actually go around the world in the, in a waveguide that is composed of the, uh, of the ground and the ionosphere. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, that's why a few words I can say about that. Right. Uh, the next question about the simulation modeling. So are there any simulation modeling packages available to simulate the lightning process? Uh, yes, there are simulation packages. I mean, you there, there are many non-commercial uh, packages to simulate uh, lightning. Like, uh, I mean, research groups have developed their own packages that will predict the electric and magnetic fields at different distances from the lightning. And there is one package that is, I think, commercial, which is called LIOV, L-I-O-V. So you can look it up, L-I-O-V. This would actually not only does it calculate the fields, but it also calculates the voltages. This was developed uh, by the EPFL and the University of Bologna. And uh, it uh, calculates the, also the voltages that are coupled onto power lines into overhead power lines. It's used in EMTP also. Right. That's important. Yeah. Uh, this uh, another question um, regarding the EMC related issues of, of lightning. So if we talk about the large objects, so what are the different EMC uh, related uh, precautions that are actually taken care of while designing these large objects? Let's say, for example, if you take example of an aircraft, uh, so what kind of measures they basically do to uh, avoid this, uh, any damage from lightning? Uh, well, you use basically in, in, uh, in fact, you mentioned aircraft, and I, I would mention that in buildings first, that you can have a lightning protection, an external lightning protection, which is the use of lightning rods, then down conductors, and then a good grounding that, that will take the if you place the lightning rods correctly, then most of the lightning that strikes the, the building will strike the lightning rod and will safely guide the current to the ground and make it dissipate into the ground. The problem is very different in, in airplanes. And in airplanes, we have a very special situation actually happening right now, because uh, in the past, airplanes were essentially made out of, out of aluminum. And uh, this is a, like a Faraday cage, basically, in a way. Right? So you can, uh, you could be struck by lightning, and even though lightning could even make bore a hole, I mean, small holes into the fuselage, but you basically you were basically protected because it's a, it was a closed metallic uh, structure. Nowadays, the situation has changed because uh, many of the commercial airplanes have up to 50% or even more composite materials, which are not conducting materials or poorly conducting. And this uh, Faraday, Faraday cage effect is no longer there. Uh, so uh, it is, what, what is done actually now is that you have some a mesh, a uh, metallic mesh uh, that is included in the, uh, in the composite materials, but this is actually, this defeats the purpose of the, of the composite material at least one of them is that the, that the airplane be lighter. So there, there is a lot of work being done nowadays on, I mean, maybe ways to protect, other ways to protect the, the lightning, but nothing is conclusive. The airplanes are well protected right, right now with these measures I talked about, you know, but if we're looking for other ways of uh, protecting them. And perhaps another interesting point is that uh, the currents that are used for testing of airplanes uh, actually don't really exactly correspond to the currents that are measured on airplanes when they get struck by lightning. 
So nowadays it's becoming more important to use the correct uh, currents. The currents for the testing are based nowadays on downward lightning. And we, as we, I saw at the beginning, the, the many airplanes or many of the lightning strikes to airplanes actually created by the airplane itself. So they are more similar to upward lightning than to downward lightning. And this is something that needs to be revisited too. Right. Uh, you mentioned in the, in the presentation about the sensors that uh, are, can be used to measure the flux. So are there any commercial sensors available uh, to measure the, let's say, electrical magnetic flux uh, for lightning? There are indeed several companies that produce uh, sensors that can be used for lightning uh, and uh, well, I, the, there are sensors, actually companies that sell you also lightning location systems that include those sensors. Uh, the, if you want very high quality sensors with high bandwidth and high precision, then you can approach some of these companies. There is one company here in Switzerland called Montana, Montana EMC, M-O-N-T-E-N-A for example, that produces them. Uh, otherwise, if you are a researcher and you're an, if, you are, if you have some experience in electronics or if you have somebody who has some experience in electronics that is working with you, you can, uh, it's not extremely difficult to develop your own. So uh, there is information about those uh, on the internet and, on, and in books actually, and uh, you can also contact me uh, and I will, I'm the person who asked the question and I can guide you to resources that allow you to design and build your own sensors. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. I think uh, the, these are the questions that I have at my side. So thank you very much again for your very informative talk and uh, your time that you spared for us for our chapter. To, for this very useful talk and I hope uh, we will see you again in future as well, most probably in Pakistan next year, in the next year conference. And thanks again. Well, let me thank you also uh, very much and thank you for the kind invitation, which I hope to be able to uh, take up. And then, and also you are also, of course invited to Switzerland anytime. And thanks to all who, thank all of those who listened and I hope this was useful. Thank you very much, all stay safe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, audience, for your uh, participation and uh, hope to see you at some other occasion. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Bye-bye. Be well.